We live in a world where water covers more than three quarters of the Earth's surface. Most of the Earth, of the water on Earth, 97% to be exact, is salt water found in the oceans. In other words, only 3% of the water on Earth is actually fresh and drinkable. So comes to mind Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Rhymes of the Ancient Mariner. Water, water everywhere, all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. The words spell out a chilling reality. One could die of thirst in the midst of water. If you don't know where to look or what or whom to seek. Have you been thirsty? We don't mean, could you point me to a water fountain or a cool drink after exercise or a short break while you've been working out in the summer's hot days these days. We mean thirsty, where your mouth was dry, your lips were parched, and your mind began to focus on and obsess only about water. The human body, after all, is two-thirds water. By the time you and I get to be 70 years old, we'll actually have required over a million gallons of water. If you lose 2% of your wa body's water supply, your energy actually goes down 20%. A 10% decrease in water, and you believe it or not, will be unable to walk. Our reading from Exodus today is about a group of really thirsty people. So thirsty, in fact, that they threatened their leader, Moses, who goes to the Lord and said, These people are ready to stone me. Responding to Moses' pleading, God provides water for the people when Moses strikes a landmark rock at Horeb and water flows from that rock. But let's step back a few moments. Nearly every Bible reader knows that Israel wandered in the Sinai wilderness for 40 long years as they moved from a place to a place that was promised to them by God. What they may not know are the surprising and sometimes disheartening stories that the people recorded along this long sojourn in the wilderness. Take a quick glance at the mountains at the Sinai wilderness and that peninsula that joins Egypt to the land that is now Israel, and it reveals something. It's not that big. Indeed, a direct trip across the peninsula at its very widest northern point today takes about three or four hours in a car. It's about 200 miles. So why did the Egyptian refugees, 40 long years did it take for them to get from the slave pits of Egypt to God's gifted land? We don't know, but we're guessing that the events that occurred in the wilderness were there so that they would learn some things in the wilderness that were crucial for them that was important for Israel, for not just that generation, but for all generations to remember and to ponder as they attempted, as we attempt to be God's people. While Moses was sent to deliver the Hebrew slaves from bondage in Egypt, he never really had that easy relationship with the people. As Exodus reveals, as the journey continued out of Egypt, the tensions between Moses and the people only intensified and grew. Immediately after the parting of the Red Sea, that was miraculous, with the Israelites marching to freedom and their captives drowning beneath the crashing in of the water, after the dancing and all of the celebrating, the grumbling began. The wilderness, turns out, was not a hospitable home. For three days they traveled without water, and when they finally came to a watering hole, they ran to the oasis with thickened tongues and dust-filled throats aching for a taste. But the water was foul and bitter and the people complained to Moses. Moses cried out to God and with the help of some nearby wood, God through Moses turned the water sweet. After a few more days of travel, the grumbling began again. There's no food, the people said. We always had food in Egypt. And again they murmured against Moses. So God sent quail in the evening and bread in the morning. And then they came to Rephidim, deep into the wilderness, a place 
which shows up on no maps, even today. They were nowhere. And when they got there, right in the heart of nowhere, they set up camp. But there was a problem with the campsite. There was no water at all, not even bitter water. And the people were not pleased. Moses, they cried, give us water to drink. The demand was direct and insistent. Should they not ask for something so basic? Should not Moses as their leader provide them with this? There was no thought of asking God. Despite the miraculous breakout from Egypt and the miracles of the past few weeks, the people were still not accustomed to looking for God. When you're in a place called Rephidim, in a broken landscape of desolation far from anything you can remotely call home, and the thirst is undeniable, the question is, what have you done for me lately? springs quickly to mind. Everything has shifted. When has everything shifted for you? Where have you felt that nothing is normal? Where have you felt that you are nowhere? Now on the one hand, we can't blame a mass of thirsty people wandering around the desert for becoming agitated after a long journey on foot with the blazing sun beating down on them. Yet, on the other hand, think of this, no people in the history of the world had ever witnessed so much incredible action taken by God on their behalf. But Moses is seeing the world through different eyes. He hears their demand for water, but he turns the demand back on the people. Why are you arguing with me, he asked. Why are you testing God? Testing God? That thought never crossed our minds, I'm sure the people must have been saying. We're thirsty. Is that a sin? Better to live in slavery in Egypt than to face death in the desert? Yes, the people had witnessed God's display of power through the plagues, and yes, they experienced God's protection as they fled from a pursuing Egyptian army, and yes, they had recently received God's provision of manna and quail, but in the face of death by dehydration, can we be so devoid of compassion that we condemn these people who had lived their lives suffering in slavery and powerless, powerlessness for their lack of faith? When presented with God's lean promise of liberty, they would have chosen slavery, evidently not having grasped that they are expected to trust God, not what they could see. Trust God for their providence before they can leave the desert. God demonstrated at every turn that even when the promise encountered, encountered an impossible barrier, the power of God on their behalf was greater than the obstacle. But when they are in need, once again, they focus on the problem instead of the provider. Rather than call on God who has seen them through every major difficulty they had faced, they complained to Moses. There's a strong lesson here for people of faith today. No matter how difficult the way may seem or how impossible the circumstances, the Lord is for us. When we choose faith instead of fear and trust in God above, the crises around us start to fall away and we become more aware of who the Lord is. Consider this example. Because there's no situation that we can get into that God cannot get us out of. Some years ago, a man was learning to fly. The instructor told the student to put the plane into a steep dive, an extended dive. The student was totally unprepared for what was about to happen. After a brief time, the engine predictably stalled and the plane began to plunge out of control. It soon became evident that the instructor wasn't gonna help the student at all. After a few seconds, what I'm sure, we sh we're sure, must have seemed like eternity, the student's mind began to function again, and quickly the student corrected the situation. Thereafter, the student turned to the instructor and began to vent their fearful frustration. The instructor calmly said to the student, there is no position you can get this plane into that I cannot get you out of. If you want to learn to fly, go up there again and do it again. At that moment, God seemed to be saying to that student, remember this, as you serve me, there is no situation that you can get yourself into. 
that I cannot get you out of. If you trust me, you will be all right. That lesson proves to be true over and over again in our lives together. Where does your trust and your resilience and your reliance reside? There's a spiritual parallel to the universal thirst for fresh water and the notion of being surrounded by seawater that cannot heal the dry throat or the parched lips of the thirsty person. The water we need for our spiritual thirst is available if we turn our hearts to faith in God more than we turn our anxious hearts to the troubles that lie before us. Faith is stronger than fear and trust in God is more powerful than the barriers we may face. Now Moses didn't go out and look for water himself. Moses turned to God once more and there was a hint of fear in his voice. But still he did not ask for water. He asked for guidance. What shall I do with these people, he asked. They are about ready to stone me to death. And then for the first time in this story of Rephidim, God makes an appearance. There's no trace of anger in God's voice. There's no chastising or despair. There are only simply orders to be followed and reminders of past deliverance. Go, Moses, God says. Go on ahead of the people with some of the elders. And that staff that you struck the Nile with, do you remember that? Take it with you. And I will be there waiting for you on a rock at a place called Horeb. You remember Horeb, don't you, Moses? Where I spoke to you, a shepherd through a burning bush. I'll be there. The people may doubt my presence here, but I'll be there. Strike the rock and water will come out and the people can drink. Moses does one more thing. He names the place where this episode occurred. Moses gets the last word and he uses it to interpret what's happened. He calls the place Masa, which means testing, and Meribah, which means quarreling. Because for Moses, none of this was about being thirsty and having no water. It was a story about the people of God questioning God's very presence among them. Though they never used the words, Moses says the people were asking the question, is God here or not? That's a good question to ask in the desert of our lives. In the midst of harshness and emptiness, is God really present at all? In the middle of muddles and messes and major disappointments, is God there or not? So in a relationship with God's people that was often frustrating, trying, and even threatening, Moses tried to give the people a sense that they lived in more than just a material world, more than they could see. It wasn't that they were wrong to be thirsty or hungry for us to be scared or frustrated. God dealt directly with their physical needs and does with ours. But what they failed to see was a God-filled world wrought with wonder and wild holiness. They saw only emptiness and Moses saw a God who comes to us in the middle of our troubled moments, a God who comes to provide not only water but living water. And how about our reliance? A man was apprehensive about his first airplane ride. His friends eager to ask how it went, ask if he enjoyed the flight. Well commented the man, it wasn't as bad as I thought it might be, but I'll tell you this, I never did put all my weight down. It's funny, as people of faith, we know that God loves us. Jesus died to prove that. We know that God holds our lives precious, and yet God is to be trusted, even in the most difficult circumstances. The stories in Exodus show us that this is so, and they confirm what Israel had experienced in the Exodus and in the Red Sea. Second, all of these stories show that God is faithful and the promises of God are, be to accept, are to be accepted at face value. God delivers. This is not to prejudge how God's promises will be fulfilled, but our experience assures us that they will be. The faithful God is to be trusted. We may look to them for reassurance on this. We can also look to our own experiences as we consider where and how God has met us shared our joys and sorrowed help us 
through difficult times. As we look beyond spectacular intervention, we see that God was with us. God is with us. We're still in the wilderness, you and I. We wander through landscapes blasted by pain and addiction, abuse and neglect, through grief and loss and failure, and we come to know the desolation of the heart, and we thirst for water, for hope, for healing. What Moses reminds us is that what we seek is God. The wilderness is a terrible place to lose your way, but it's a wonderful place to find it. And thanks be to God.